We know exactly how life began, and science can give us the answers. Or can it? We'll be joined by Dr. James Tour on this episode of All Rise. All rise, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. It's me, your host, once again, Derek Caldwell, and I'm with author and speaker, Abdu Murray. And usually I would ask Abdu how he's doing, but we want to jump right into it today because we have an incredible guest for you. Uh, we're going to be talking with Dr. James Tour. Uh, he's a synthetic organic chemist, professor of chemistry and materials science and nanoengineering at Rice University. He has over 800 research publications. I mean, re read his bio. This is wild. Now, the first question will reflect what I thought as soon as I read all of this. 130 granted patents and over 100 pending patents in 2024. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and his work has been used to create several products and companies, some of which have helped with traumatic brain injury and spinal cord repair. And he's been on, on numerous top scientist lists. So this is a, a, a an incredible, real-life, big-time, big-brained scientist. And he's also a devout Christian who spends a lot of his time demonstrating how you can't have an origin of life without having an external agent guide the process. If you want to check out his stuff, we're going to have links down below. But uh, the, the YouTube channel is Dr. James Tour. That's T O. You are so, Doctor Tour. Just to jump into it real quick, do you sleep and um, how and where do you find the time? Are you able to stretch time? Uh, Hugh Ross might be interested in talking to you. If so, well, that's very kind of you. I, I wish my wife would have heard that introduction, <laughs> so she sees how fortunate she really is. <laughs> yeah. How is but, Shireen, by the way? Is she okay? Yeah, she's doing just fine. She's uh. She's continuing to just bless people, and uh, I just just want to keep her happy. <laughs> See, you're you're smart in many ways, not just scientifically, but relationally. That's uh, the wise way to go. Absolutely. Um, hey, you know, I, one thing that I, I'd love for our uh, viewers and listeners, this will be on our YouTube channel and on our podcast platforms, uh, to hear is um, we've 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 spoken about a lot, and uh, and uh, Derek's written quite a bit about. Uh, the supposed conflict theory, the conflict uh, between science and matters of faith. And as someone with a deep and abiding faith um, uh, in God, but also a deep and abiding passion for science, um, uh, tell us a little bit about your, your, your walk of faith as a scientist. Like, how do you see these two things interact? And, um, how, you know, if you give us a snapshot of how you became a believer in the first place, and does your faith inform your scientific endeavor? Here's an important question. Why would anyone believe that a man named Jesus died and rose from the dead? If you don't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send an email to tour at drjamestour.org and we'll set up a meeting and I will tell you about why I embrace the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, I'll start with how I became a believer uh, so we can run this in, in some pseudo chronological order. I was 18 when I came to the Lord. Uh, I come from a Jewish home, a secular Jewish home in New York City. Grew up just out, just north of the city. Um, went to college right after my 18th birthday. Uh, a young man shared with me, a young, young man with Navigators Campus Ministry, shared the gospel with me. And uh, um, it really shook me to, to see, you know, I, I at first... I read this verse, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's what he showed me in the Scriptures. And I said, I haven't sinned, I'm not a sinner. And, and I know exactly why I said that, because in modern secular Judaism, we do not reflect upon sin. Uh, little things aren't sin. Uh, and I said to him, I never robbed a bank, I never killed anybody, how could I be a sinner? Then he turned to Matthew 5, 28, and he had me read that out loud. And Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I was addicted to pornography from the age of 14. Uh, I was working in a, in a gas station on the highway just outside New York City. And men used to throw away their magazines, and, and uh, uh, that's where I was really first exposed to this. And... Um, by the time I was 18, I was heavily addicted. Hmm. And uh, uh, so I was deeply convicted. And, and the question is, well, why should I even be convicted? Why, why should that be? 
I didn't know Jesus was Jewish. Who knew? Uh, the rabbis actually <laughs> told us that Jesus was Christian because they didn't want us looking into this thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, but when Jesus is trying to get hold of your heart, his words have this enormous power over you. Mm. And I was deeply convicted from that moment. How could I commit adultery in my heart? I was enough of a Jew to know that adultery was one of the, the Ten Commandments, and, and I'd, I'd be violating it to commit adultery. But how can I do it in my heart? Adultery is a physical thing. Mm. And Jesus just zeroes right in on our hearts. And uh, uh, he went through the, the gospel presentation, and I... He probably could have closed the deal that day if he had known better how to do it. But um, <laughs> a couple of months later, I was in my room all alone, and I, I had been reflecting on this and on my sin. And, and I got on my knees and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, forgive me, because I'm a sinner. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, to my right, is somebody standing. And I looked over to my right, and nothing I could see clearly with my eyes, but I knew that was Jesus standing right next to me. Wow. And I was already on my knees. I turned. I put my face on the ground toward him. And I just started weeping. Just this tremendous love and forgiveness was being poured out. This this burden of sin that I had been carrying for several months just lifted from me. And I was just enjoying his presence. He, he wasn't gone in a snap. I mean, he just, just stayed there. And as long as I was there, he was there. And I remember after a while, I, I stood up. I wiped my tears and I could not stop thinking about Jesus. Uh, and, and I remember I was even dreaming about Jesus at night in my dreams. In my dreams, I was dreaming about telling people about Jesus. It's a Jewish kid dreaming about telling people about Jesus. Wow. I didn't know what that meant, but it was prophetic. That's what my life would become, mm. telling people about Jesus. And this young man saw me a couple of weeks later, the same guy who had shared with me. He said, Jim, have you received Jesus in your heart? I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. <laughs> Something happened to me. And I said to him, how can I stay close to God like this? I've never felt like this before. Hmm. He said, if you read your Bible every day, you'll stay close to God. If you don't, you won't. And I've read my Bible every day for 46 years. I mean, wow. every day for 46 years. And I read from Genesis 1.1. All the way through to Revelation 22, when I'm done, I start again. Mm. And I just pick up where I left off the day before. I'm in no hurry. I don't complete the Bible in a year. If God wanted me to complete it in a year, he just said, complete this book in a year. I take my time, and and I can spend a week in a paragraph uh, just enjoying it. So that's, that's, that's the background story. How can a scientist uh, deal with faith? You know, I've been in science my whole life. I started as a chemistry major at the age of 18, started doing undergraduate research and I've done research ever since. And, and, uh, um, I've never stopped. I have never seen the Bible contradicted by a fact of science. I have not. Other people may have uh, share that with me. Uh, I've not. And, and so I've seen theories, scientific theories, certainly, contesting with things that are written in the Bible, but scientific theories change all the time. If you're involved in science, you see this all the time. Mm -hmm. Certainly on the order of decades, scientific theories are changing all the time. We go from a steady state approximation to to this, to this, uh, um, to to, uh, uh, an expanding universe. Most scientists in the 1950s uh, believed that the universe had always been here. Mm-hmm. And then in 1964, with the the discovery of, of microwave background radiation, I mean, it, it was clear that our universe is expanding. And so so such a fundamental thing that everybody grasped, uh, boom, you, you're told to let go of it. And, and so science changes all the time as far as the theories go. Water is H2O. That's not going to change. That's a right. fact. That's not going to change. That doesn't contradict with anything in the Bible. Then there's other things in the Bible that, that sometimes our interpretation of it modifies. And this certainly happens as, as we age, as we get older, as we look at things differently, as we get more information. And, and uh, we look at things, and, and uh, uh, our interpretation may change uh, of the Bible. But I've never seen a controversy. So for me, there is not that problem that other people seem to have. I have not that problem. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, as you were speaking about that, 
um, uh, oftentimes uh, I think people would take a look at someone with your uh, level of accomplishment scientifically um, and your, uh, your grasp of it, uh, but also your firm commitment and say, well, you know, sort of a Stephen Jay Gould kind of a idea of there's non-overlapping magisteria. You know, science tells us about one part of the world and Religion might tell us about other parts of the world, but don't mix, mix these, th these two things together because they have really have nothing to do with each other. And what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that um, uh, there's plenty of time when these things do inform each other and they can overlap uh, plenty of times. And you don't have to hang your faith on the, on, the, on, on the hook and then put on your lab coat. You can put them both on at the same time. In fact, uh, I wonder, does your, love, does your faith provide any inspiration for the pursuit of science? Well, yes, it does. And I, I, I think that only a rookie in one of the two areas, the Bible or science, would ever say that the two do not overlap. Hmm. If a scientist says that, I would, I would argue that that scientist has probably not spent more than 15 minutes really studying the Bible. Hmm. Can you imagine a student taking a 1,200-page organic chemistry textbook. That's what I teach, organic chemistry. It's 1,200 pages is it's, it's the introductory book, 1,200 pages. Yeah. And look at that for 15 minutes and then come to me and say, ah, there's nothing really here. I would think that I were talking to an idiot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that a person would look at that book for 15 minutes and think that there's, there's nothing valuable here. But that's what they do with the Bible all the time. Yeah. They'll look at it for 15 minutes and make a critique of it Mm. In that way. And so when somebody does that, I feel as if I'm talking to an idiot that a person would do that. Yeah. And so, so um, uh, a person who has really spent time in the Word of God, mm -hmm. and, and if you spend time in it and, and say, Lord, speak to me, speak to me through this book. I mean, you see the wisdom that comes out of this, the, the, the insight, the understanding, and, and it's as if the God of the universe speaks through this book. Mm -hmm. And then you take somebody who has spent a life in science, and, and, and then to, to know these two areas, you'd never say that. Mm -hmm. But when you only know one or the other, you might think that. Mm -hmm. So how does, it, how does it help me? How do the scriptures help me? Well, when I pray, I don't pray, Lord, that my reactions would work and nobody else's would work. Mine have to work the same way as everybody else's or else I'm in big trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's just, just what happens, ha has to happen in science. But, but I pray, Lord, give me insight. Lord, give me clarity. And, and two days ago, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, it was, it was one day ago. It was yesterday morning. I was praying in the morning and I was on my knees and I said, Lord, it's time again. We need another breakthrough. We need another breakthrough. And I said, Lord, I don't know what it is, but just open up a new area for us. Yesterday afternoon, a guy comes walking into my office with his cell phone, and he's got a picture that he, he, he was a, actually a, he had downloaded the picture from a, a scanning electron microscope onto his cell phone, and he showed me this picture, and he said, look what I made. And it was amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> so there it is, wow. right, right where I prayed, prayed for this. And and uh, you don't want these coming every day because you, you gotta, you gotta exploit this. You gotta. It takes time to develop sure. it now and and flesh the thing out. So you don't want new discoveries like this every day. But I'm talking to the Lord all the time. I'm praying to Him all the time for for clarity, where where I don't understand something. And I say, Lord, make it clear. Lord, help me. And then on the other side, I take science and I look at this and I'm amazed at the glories of God, mm -hmm. that God knew this all along, mm -hmm. especially in a biological system. You look at this and you say, Lord, this is so remarkable. I mean, I, I worked on 20, 25 years ago, we were working on the building of a, of a synthetic brain. We called it, the DARPA told us, called it a molecular computer. They didn't want bad press. So. Mm -hmm. But it was really a synthetic brain where we take a disordered array of molecules. We don't know how they're assembled. Uh, but we would program it to do something useful. It's just like in our brains. We don't know the interconnect pathway, the neuron interconnect pathway in our brain. But, but uh, we use it all the time. Hmm. And so you don't have to know the interconnect pathway in a computer chip. We know where every transistor is, 
every place it is and, and uh, where they are and, and uh, all, every billion and billion of them, you, you know. But you don't know it in your brain and you use your brain all the time because you program it to do something useful. So a little child grows up at, at first, they, they stick their food in their ear, they don't know any better. And then, then after, after a little while, they, they realize you, you put the food in the mouth, it's much better. And, and so they're training the brain. And this is what we could do. And we were learning to train these, these little molecular computers or synthetic brains. And we could, it was just, just, we could only do very simple little things with it. And then my th- boy was like three or four at the time and he comes running to me and I'm like wow how do you how do you do this mm-hmm. and and you, you see how wonderful this biological world is and and when you understand the science you just say wow lord this is amazing this is utterly amazing so so both things move me toward god mm-hmm. and 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 my my spending time in the bible just gives me faith that, that, that God is there and God has arranged these things and God is consistent. This whole idea of consistency that we have in the scriptures where God is a consistent God and when he works outside of that domain, it's considered a miracle. And he, he tells us about this. But, but uh, why should anybody presuppose that if you do a reaction once, it should happen again if you put it under the same conditions? That's because we see the consistency of God in the scriptures. And uh, um, so it, all of this drives me toward the Lord and gives me a greater appreciation for my science. Just a quick reminder, this organization is run totally by volunteers, but we do have to pay for the production work. If you could help us out by going to give jesusandscience.org we'd appreciate it or you can click in the description box below if you can't give we certainly understand but please just give us a thumbs up and click subscribe thank you you know that as you, as you speak uh, on, on this um i'm sort of reminded of uh, something i've said a couple of times and i got it i believe i got it from mary poplin in her book the Rea- is reality secular where she pointed out you look at proverbs 25 verse 2 and 3 where it says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is glory of kings to seek things out. And as you were talking about the idea of asking God for a breakthrough and then seeing something and then even seeing the wonder of your son's ability to run up to something compared to like, you know, how we train things to do small things. We don't see these scientific discoveries all the time. There is a certain gift in the delight of discovery. So it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, not so that we never discover it, but so that it becomes the glory of kings to seek things out because we engage in the sheer delight of the discovery. And like a father delighting when their son first learns to read or their daughter first learns to uh, recognize how numbers work, we delight even more than the child does. And I wonder uh, if that proverb is, is signaling well, to us that science is God's gift to us to be able to discover the things that he's concealed, not so that we don't discover them, but so that we get that rush of saying, oh my mm-hmm. goodness, I see this now, and its ability to, to glorify God as well. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we got a bunch of questions we want to ask you about the, the current state of things. Uh, that's a wonderful preamble, I think, into um, really getting into this. Um, Derek, before you get into some of your questions, one of the things that occurred to me as you were talking is we did an uh, episode on expert witnesses. Um, <clears throat> I think this will be a nice segue into some of the, uh, the specifics, Derek, we want to talk to Dr. Tour about. But Jim, one of the things that as a lawyer, I know that there are certain criteria under what's called the Daubert test for whether an expert witness's testimony can be admitted into court. And um, <clears throat> Amongst the criteria from Federal Rule 702 and the Daubert Supreme Court decision in 1993 uh, is that the, the testimony or your ex, the expert's scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge helps the trier of fact or the jury understand something of, materi- of, of, uh, of, of material importance. But also the testimony has to be based on sufficient facts or data, and the testimony is a product product of reliable principles and methods. The reliability of the world uh, is what makes science possible uh, in terms of consistency, and that you've reliably, the expert will have reliably applied those principles to the facts of the case. Now, I say all that because one of the things you're known for is talking about origin of life research. And um, there are some uh, myths, tropes, 
um, things that people commonly say about the state of our origin of life conclusions that we we know how we got here and that kind of thing. So um, the first question I think we could ask is, what if anything, based on this idea of do we have reliable data? Um, you're someone who's read the stuff, and I'd love for you to go into how it is that you come to your conclusions. What, if anything, can origin of life research right now tell us about how we got, how we got here, the early beginnings of humanity or life in general? What can it tell us about that? Uh, like nothing. <laughs> it can tell us nothing about that. But we, 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 can, we, can, get it, we can get far more basic than that. Okay. I mean, we are really complex entities, but, but if we just say, how about a cell, a living cell, and not even a complex cell like a human cell, mm -hmm. but a very simple cell, like a bacterium, uh, a very simple cell, cellular structure, and, and we know how simple a cell could be and be alive. Biophysicists have already calculated this. So when people say, well, cells were really simple back then. Okay, well, we know how simple they are. And, and uh, um, from the fossil record, we see that the simplest of cells that we can isolate from the fossil record are about the same complexity as the simplest cells that we, we have on Earth today. Right? Mm -hmm. But we can even take it further back from that. We can know what are the simplest structures. When you look at that, these are made up of different components. So you have to have amino acids, and you have to have a good amount of different amino acids. Right now, there are, there are 20 that are essential amino acids, and you're going to have to have a sort of a big number, a, a number about that size. You can't have one. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have to have carbohydrates. Uh, you have to have the lipids. And... You have to have the nucleic acids, which are the DNA and the RNA. The lipids make up the, the, the outer membranes. And so we already know you have to have those components. So we're, look, we're operating now not on a person, but on the simplest of, of living structures, which is a cell. That is the simplest living structure you can get. All right, so now we've broken it up into those four basic classes of components. And of those four, are there any that anybody has ever seen that could be synthesized under early earth conditions. Well, what are early earth conditions? Mm -hmm. These would be conditions where there's a number of different small gas molecules. There may be meteorites delivering certain things here. Uh, you can get uh, uh, certain amino acids that, that would spontaneously form by some explosion and and. and there are just so many things that form. You could find a few amino acids. Uh, they're almost always racemic, and when the, which means you have the right-handed and left-handed form, and, and it's very hard for life to think about forming from that. And, and we, we know that from other things like chiral induced spin selectivity. But um, uh, uh, you can get small amounts of these delivered, but none of that which is delivered from out of space from these explosions that have formed would ever be useful because what happens is they're in such a mixture of other things, they're not useful. Mm -hmm. You have to have clean chemistry for, in order to get to work. So of the four, of, we, don't, we don't know how to get to cells, so let's say of the four classes of compounds. Do we know how to make any of those four classes of compounds on an early earth? The answer is no, because they have to have stereo control. Even the lipids are hard. But then when you have the amino acids, but let's just take the smallest structure, the amino acids, and a monosaccharide, a sugar, and a nucleotide, which is the, what, the components that make up DNA and RNA. How do you now polymerize these, hook these together in the larger structures? Nobody knows. Nobody knows how you get the polymerization of the amino acids into proteins because they have these side chains that interfere. There's these interfering groups. And, and uh, uh, they get in the way. So using synthetic, modern synthetic techniques, we have to go through this laborious protecting these and then deep protecting other ones. And, 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 uh, but how do you do that on an early earth? Nobody knows. Carbohydrates are actually the most difficult structure to deal with, the sugars. Uh, we have no idea how you would get clean carbohydrate formation, but even if you had it clean, how would you polymerize them? Nobody knows. Just a, just a very simple 
hooking together of, of a couple of units is, is statistically very hard to get any clean coupling. And every cellular dysfunction harkens back to a concomitant uh, uh, hookup problem in the, in the polysaccharides. So you, when, when this thing is hooked up wrong, the cell doesn't work. You have, you have uh, uh, the RNA structure. The RNA has a real problem. Number one, RNA is, is very unstable when you start putting these oligonucleotides, these nucleotides together to form the oligomers of these things. They're unstable. Number two, you can have, again, this, this interfering problem. You get what's called the two prime, five prime linkage in, in addition to the desired three prime, five prime linkage. And so nobody, nobody knows how to overcome that. So we don't know how you get the polymer structures. Even if you were given the monomeric structures, we don't know how you get the monomeric structures. Now, even if you had all of those, let's say, let's say you had all the polymeric structures. If I gave a modern scientist today, not just a scientist, let's say a team of the top 100 scientists that work in the area of synthetic chemistry and molecular biology and synthetic, synthetic biologists, Let's say you had a team of 100 and you gave them all the DNA they wanted, all the RNA, uh, uh, all the polypeptides, all the polysaccharides in any order they wanted attached. So again, we don't know how to do that, but let's give it to them. Mm -hmm. Could they assemble a cell? We give them all the lipids. Could they assemble a cell today in their laboratory? And the answer is no. And none of them would ever claim that they could because it would be so silly for them to stand there to say that they could do that. Well, why don't they do that today and win a Nobel Prize? Because if you could take the raw components that you've extracted from a cell. You can already get these. You can deconstruct a cell and you have all of these. Could you put it back together again and put Humpty Dumpty back together and make a cell? The answer is no. If wow. anybody could, they would, and they would win a Nobel Prize that very year, that same year, they'd win the Nobel Prize if they could do that. They can't do it. So that's why they don't do it. So how would you do that on an early earth when you don't have all the tools of modern science going for you, when you don't have a mind working for you, when you don't, all early earth is, is a bunch of small molecules floating around. But so even if you had all these, so, so it, we have to divorce this from thinking that, that to start life, you have to come up with a human being. No, we, we go back to the very simplest of things, a single cell and the simplest of cells which is much simpler than a bacterium that you generally find today. And then, and then you, ha you say, okay, even the components of the cell I can't make. Mm -hmm. And then a hidden in here, which I didn't mention, is the informational code. But I'll give that team of 100 people even the informational code, meaning the DNA structure, the RNA structure, the proteins already in the structures they want, all the polysaccharides in the structure they want. All of that is code information. We have no idea where the code came from. It has to come from somewhere outside the cell because it can't come from in the cell because it was needed to construct the cell. So nobody knows where the code information came from. So there, there's all of this lostness here. It's a vast morass of lostness. And these people, when they say anything other than this, it's fallacious. It's just not correct. And as soon as you challenge them on it, uh, they just get quiet. They get very quiet and they go away. And, and it's because it, it's just, just, uh, just not true that they understand where life come from, can come from. Nobody can even give a proposal on this. So that, that's the state of the field. Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah, you know, um, that makes me think, too. I mean, everything that I learned about science growing up and the, the idea that you're, you're, you know, you're testing hypotheses and you never quite say what you do know. You're kind of in many times saying, well, here we've learned what isn't the way. And we kind of learned that this is a, a pathway, but we haven't defined it completely. So it's surprising to me, like, what, why is what you're saying, I guess, controversial to some scientists who should, they, they have the, the same data, they, they see what you see, they can't, in what I've seen, I've seen some of your interactions, and um, they can't really refute it. So why the drive to constantly say, yes, we've figured it out, when they haven't, and then when it's pointed out, 
to sort of like this is the controversial thing that we we don't know something we clearly don't know and as you've pointed out before if you get beyond the abstract of the papers and look at what they've actually uh, what they've actually done they're tinkering with it the whole time because the first time it didn't work the second time it didn't work if we add this if we hold its hand and walk it across this way um you know so what do you, what do you think that is? is this a worldview clash is this a cultural clash what's going on in the in the field there you know m- most people that get into this area they don't they 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 they'll start working in a group where origin of life research is done and then they grow up in that group and they go off on their own. They might get an academic position and they'll continue working in the area of origin of life. It's a, it's a very slow involvement that, that, that evolves with time. And uh, they get involved with this thing. You meet people then that have been working in the area for 40 years, writing papers and uh, making suggestions within those papers and making claims within those papers. And then all of a sudden, Jim Tour comes along and says, no, you missed it. I mean, none of that's going to work. And here's the reasons. Uh, Because you could have never made that molecule in the first place. I mean, you you did this, you did this in your lab, and you cheated here, you cheated there. None of that would be available on an early earth. And when there are organic chemists, not when they're biologists, not even when they're biochemists, sometimes they don't even see... when you're a synthetic organic chemist, you see exactly what I see. I mean, this is not a secret. You see exactly what I see. And I have challenged people. I've challenged Steve Benner. I mean, I, I mean, I use his name. If it gives you problems I, that I use his name, I mean, he's a famous guy in the era of origin of life. He has, has publicly said uh, uh, all of the, most of the paradoxes in origin of life have been solved. That's like so ridiculous. Like none of the paradoxes, like none have been solved. And there's thousands of them. Mm. None of them have been solved. And I have said to him, Steve, you see exactly what I say, what I see. You are a synthetic chemist. You see exactly what I'm seeing. And he says nothing. He says nothing in response because he sees it. But here's a man who's built his career for 40 plus years working on this thing and making these claims. It's not easy to backtrack on this. Yeah. Not easy. So that's one of the things. The other thing is that when you grow up in this, you, there's all these other people. Uh, I'm sorry, when you don't grow up in this, there's all these, this community of people in the origin of life have, have made these proposals on how it could have occurred. You've never studied it yourself. And that's the same thing that happened to me. Uh, I heard a talk on carbohydrates about, oh, seven years ago, maybe, eight years ago, talk on carbohydrates, and I saw the complexity of this, and I said, this is, there's no way this thing could have formed, and I, I wanted to get into the evolutionary arguments, and I just started to, to say, no, I need to understand exactly how these things came about, and then, and then I started to look into origin of life. I talked to some of my, my colleagues who work in the biochemical area, and I said, uh, how did life first form? And they gave me some articles and I started reading. And as I read those articles, it became clear, this is a bunch of nonsense. This doesn't work. This chemistry would never work. And, and uh, uh, so here I was, an organic chemist, having been an organic chemist, a, a, a PhD chemist for, for uh, uh, 25 years. <laughs> and I had no idea that this thing was a house of cards. I had no idea. I just took for granted what people were saying, that, you know, the carbohydrates come by the foremost reaction and these things form it. But as soon as you start looking at it, you say, there's nothing here. This is is not how it could be. And this is what happened. So I did that 14-part series on the origin of life. And when I did that 14-part series, some of my colleagues uh, watched that, and and they, they said to me, you know, don't use, our, don't use my name, but I agree with everything you're saying because it became now obvious to them. So when you're outside this community, it's not like we're reading in this community. I, I had my own work to do. I, I was very busy and I had all my emails to answer and all my own research to do. And so the, the main group of scientists that are out there, they have no idea 
that, that this, this really is a house of cards. Now, when chemists are, are, when, when chemists are confronted with this, then there's a real problem because then they start saying, hey, I see this. This is a real problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they don't want to have to go through what I've gone through. They don't want to have to go through the criticism. They don't want to have to go through yeah. the cutting of, of grant support. They don't want to have to have the community coming against them. And so, so why bother? And I understand. Why bother? You've got, you got a lot of other things to do in life. So, so this is part of it. I don't know that it's a direct assault on, on, on worldviews, that, that I'm going to wake up this morning and I, I'm, I'm going to hit that Bible worldview today and I'm going to clash yeah. with it. I mean, it's not, it's not that direct intent. You, you kind of evolve into this. The more you study it and the more papers you publish, uh, and you, you know, you've thrown in your hat, you've thrown in your scarf into this ring and, and you become more and more committed now. And so you have to go with this. And when things don't match up, it's very hard to say, hey, none, none of what I wrote about in that paper really works because I, I, I just can't make this thing work on a, on a really prebiotic earth. And so it's very hard to back up. That's a very long answer to a short question, but I hope that kind of paints the context for this. Uh, I, I got to say, I think that uh, the length of the answer is very appropriate for the depth of the question. Uh, so the length might be one thing, but the depth of the question definitely required that length of an answer. Because one of the things we talk about oftentimes in our own ministry is that it isn't just a matter of um, uh, facts and data oftentimes. There's motivations behind it that have nothing to do with being nefarious, nothing to do with you know, twisting your mustaches, thinking of ways to undermine something. Oftentimes it's just um, normal, human, sometimes sinful, sometimes broken, sometimes just mistaken commitments to various things, and we have to stick with those things. Um, the thing that I w- I, I'd be interested in following up on with regard to that is, one, I have a, a clarifying question is, so to make sure when when we look at the articles and, and go beyond the abstracts, but we look at the actual articles and look at the findings and someone who is, not all of us can be trained necessarily or maybe not trained, but familiar enough with how scientific papers are actually written and some of the terminology and the jargon, but also the equations and these kind of things to know, here's what the abstract says. I can read this thing and the abstract is a little bit more of a generalization of what this really says. When we look at the articles themselves, do you think it's the case that the scientific community on origin of life, when they can say that they've solved these paradoxes, are the articles really saying that, or are we just headlining them? In other words, are we mischaracterizing what the articles are really saying, or are the articles mischaracterizing the actual science? The articles are mischaracterizing the actual science. Wow. The articles themselves are, are misleading. And, and uh, uh, a lot of times you don't even know that until you've gone to the supplementary material. Okay. When I write a paper that might be three pages long in a journal, it is not uncommon for me to have 100 plus pages of supplemental information behind that. Sure. And, and, uh, uh, and that's just the way things work. I mean, I, I just finished a rebuttal just to, to share with the reviewers of a paper, and the rebuttal is almost 100 pages. Just, just speaking. So there's, there's a lot of meat that, that's there. And it's when you get into the supplemental information, which the normal person cannot read, not because they're stupid, they're very smart. It's just that they don't have the nomenclature, they don't have the training, they don't understand what these, these big words mean, because it's, 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 it's IUPAC nomenclature. It's a language that they've never learned. And, uh, um, and they don't understand what these plots mean, what, you know, so many different spectroscopic techniques. I don't understand when I le- read legal briefs. I, I, I mean, I get kind of lost in, the, in this, and it's circuitous. But you learn how to deal with this when you go to, to law school, and that first year is a killer. I saw it with my daughter because mm-hmm. they're training you to think like an attorney. Mm-hmm. And, and you don't normally go in there thinking like an attorney, and you have to be trained. Your, your mind has to be trained, and that's why that first year is just so grueling for people. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so they don't have, when you don't have the ability to look at the experiment and what they've done and what they've really shown, and they claim that we did get some of the, oligo, the, the linear uh, uh, oligonucleotide, well, how do you know that? 
Well, then you look at the experimental and you see in the experimental, there is no indication that you got the linear, uh, 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 that you um, that you got the linear polynucleotide or you got the linear polypeptide. There's no indication of that, hmm. and and they'll show these spots on a gel. That doesn't tell you the the precise structure. That doesn't tell you if you had some branching occurring, and uh, uh, when you when you get billions of compounds, you can't sift out to see that you've gotten that right structure. And the, the probability of getting the right structure is very very small, and especially the longer it gets. And so, so you look at the data and you say, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say this, but nobody called them on it. You say, well, why didn't the reviewers call them on it? Because the reviewers are from the origin of life community. You get reviewers that work in that area that understand it, and then they are writing papers the same way. And it's this incestual sort of thing, but so the papers themselves make claims that, that uh, are just not factual based on what people have received. Then what happens is that is magnified by an order of magnitude when it gets into the press. Because when that, when that uh, uh, researcher is interviewed by the press, then they become really loosey-goosey with their speech. And uh, they say many things, and then the press ramps this thing up, and before you know it, we are on the verge of, of, of uh, figuring out how life has formed. So much so that the vast majority of the general public, because I've showed you the surveys, the vast majority of the general public thinks that, that scientists have made life in the laboratory, simple life like a bacterium. And a third of the general public thinks that scientists have made complex life like a frog. Frog is a complex life yeah. in the laboratory. So that's how bad it is. And, uh, uh, but it starts, the origin of the problem is with the origin of life researchers themselves. Hmm. We cannot throw this at the feet of the press. Hmm. They, they, they enhance it, but it's, it, this goes right back to the, to the scientists themselves. You know, I was, I was uh, uh, talking with an AI uh, developer. Uh, at one of the leading AI institutions in the world very recently. And I was talking, I'm, I'm writing a book on this, and I'm thinking about AI and um, the theological and the social implications for um, artificial intelligence. Um, and I said, you know, there's a lot of people talking about AI in a way that is, um, it seems to me the more I look into AI, it's a little overblown. Like the whole generative AI and AI can, uh, can, can create things on its own and do all these things. And this person who is a leading AI developer said, you know, a lot of that's on purpose. A lot of this uh, sort of hype and even the scaremongering is on purpose because that creates incredible marketing because if you scare people about AI, then people will want to control the AI, which means they'll want to use the AI you developed uh, in some ways. And so the press gets a hold of it. And if you tell the press enough things that are um, overblown about the progress we're actually making, people will want it more. Um, now, that's not the same necessarily, the same motivation here, but I think it's a similar pattern where it's um, we overstate the case. Um, and then the press gets a hold of it, and they really overstate the case. And then the public says, well, the scientists wouldn't be wrong about this, and the press wouldn't misrepresent what they said. So clearly we believe that, yeah, we've actually made um, complex animals like frogs and all this stuff. It sort of reminds me of that kind of a social snowball effect. So, um, uh, And I speak about this in terms of the post-truth sort of context is that feelings and preferences matter more than facts and truth. And that virus, that post-truth virus, uh, infects everybody and you're not immune to it just because you wear a lab coat, um, uh, as it were to me. So I, I, f I feel like there's a similar pattern there. Um, but uh, also, it, it seems to me that someone, uh, uh, especially, like, I, I say this, it's one thing, okay? I'm a lawyer by training. I know how to s assess an argument, assess evidence. It's one thing. But, some, but I would necessarily need, I think, to have to make a full case, uh, sort of an expert witness. And that's why when you have a legal case, you have uh, a plaintiff and defendant, and um, you have um, expert witnesses on both ends uh, who often are, are experts in the same field and then will pre present competing claims. And it's up to the trier of fact, the jury, in this case, our audience, uh, to sort of determine whether or not uh, one expert's conclusions are a little more credible than another expert's. 
all this goes back to me to a biblical principle, which is, you know, one seems convincing until another comes along and challenges the case. And it seems to me that what you're doing is you're challenging the case, not for the poo-pooing of the scientific endeavor or the denigration of the scientific enterprise um, writ large, whether it's university level or research science, but you're just calling us to a sense of honesty on this. Yeah, I, you know, this is a dirty business, and, and I, I, feel, I feel saddened sometimes. I make these videos and I expose these guys, and uh, um, even, even uh, at, at, at one point a year and a half ago, I was, I was you know, just going down the line and, and, and showing the things that people had said on the Internet and then, and then knocking them down, and, and I stopped. In the middle of it, in fact, I had announced, you know, we're going to go, we're going to talk about this person's work, this person. And I stopped because it became such an irksome work. I don't like tearing down my colleagues. I really don't. And, and I consider them colleagues. I mean, we're, we, we're, we're scientists. We, we, we work in similar sorts of areas, and um, it, it's no fun. Uh, and I feel for them. I mean, they were trying to get their grant money, and they, scientists are like everybody else. We want to allay our fears. We want to look good in the eyes of the people around us. We, and and uh, uh, that's just who we are. We're just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the last few years, because of the pandemic and things like this and the things that were said, scientists have lost a ton of credibility, and deservedly so, mm -hmm. uh, for the things that were propagated. And, and uh, uh, so I'm not so sure that people are as prone to grab onto these things. I mean, I, I was drawn in by what scientists said, and I'm a lot less prone now. You know, I, I would defer to people who were experts in that area. You know, you talked about AI. We, we use AI in my own lab. We've written papers on machine learning, which is a subclass of AI. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what you just said uh, is right. You know, I mean, that was your friend who's an expert in AI. I, I don't know that that is correct, but I would defer to, to him or her because, because they're experts in the field. And so, so uh, we have a tendency to do that, and, but people are doing that less. And, and I think yeah. scientists deserve less less uh, 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 street cred because of what we've put people through in the recent past. But I am, I am just, I am exposing this thing because it, it, it is, uh, it has terribly uh, uh, deceived the general public. When, when the general public, two thirds of them think people have made, scientists have made simple bacteria in the lab and we're nowhere close to that. It's not like we're just on the verge. We're nowhere close and, and people still propagate this stuff. So yeah, I come out with it, but it, it's not easy to do because yeah. uh, it hurts. It hurts to have to do this. And then when they react back and they start saying things, it, it's almost all devolves into ad hominem attack. Mm -hmm. They attack Jim Tour. They attack Jim Tour with accusations of all sorts of things, but they will not touch the science. So what I did is I came with five, five simple little questions that I put before a YouTuber who he says answered them all. But then I put it before 10 experts. None of them could answer any of the questions, not even one. Not even one of the questions. And I said, if you answer just one of the five, I'll stop talking about this whole origin of life. I'll take down all my content on my YouTube channel. Nobody could touch it mm. because these experts know they, they can't answer these. And these are five of 5,000 that I could have asked. Just very simple, basic questions. And so, so uh, uh, they couldn't answer it. And nobody comes forth. But what they'll do is they'll attack me. And, and you know, that's kind of the way human beings are. Yeah. You know, you attack my religion, I'm going to attack you back. And so, so this is kind of what it is. And, and um, yeah. uh, it, it's an irksome work. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you definitely, I think, nailed something there too. Yeah, you attack my religion, I'll attack you back. And, um, you know, there's something very similar even going on now in, in theoretical physics, which isn't, you know, it has been for a while, but people like... Jim Baggett and David Lindley and Sabine Hassenfelder pushing back against string theorists and saying it's a failed theory. Why are we still putting all this money in it? Uh, the Large Hadron Collider did not find what you said it was going to find. It's interesting to see it in the field you're talking about because that is coming from, you know, theoretical physics is hard to 
have like, here's the empirical evidence of this. And they're kind of saying, you know, this idea that you need to have empirical evidence of something in this field, that's like old school science. And, you know, we need to sort of mature up. Um, but uh, it's fascinating to see it in a field that where you, as you've said, you can point out, no, we can look and see exactly what you did and what you actually produced and see the difference between the two. So it's, um, yeah, it is fascinating. And as you said, I mean, it's disheartening to see the, the sort of um, zeal with which people kind of hold on to those things. But, you know, as you were talking, I was, I was trying to think about, you know, what, what would be one of the, if there was a potential maybe misunderstanding of the, the points you're making, I think, um, because you've, you've said something like we have no idea how a lot of times. And when some people hear Christians say that about something science related, they'll say, aha, that's a God of the gaps. We just don't know yet, but one day we will. And I just wanted to clarify because I think you're saying essentially in at some level, it's impossible. We can't, prove it scientifically without with early earth atmosphere and and uh, uh without adding stuff in the whole time um without taking a creator role with the experiment so yeah could you clarify that because it's you're not making a god of the gaps argument um you're making it i think very much uh, there will be this permanent limitation to what we can prove because we're not accepting sort of the reality of the situation. Actually, that's not quite right of the positions that I take. So I, I, I have never said that we will never know. All I've said is that we don't know and we're nowhere close. And we can tell. In science, you can tell when you're close to the target. And the way you do that is you look at your approach to the target. Are you getting more... But what's happening is our target is moving further away from us much faster than we are approaching it. Right. We, may go, we may go a nanometer closer, but this is moving miles further away. Hmm. And that's because the cell is becoming more complex in our understanding, not that it's evolving. It's, be, it, it's static as far as the time frames that we're, we're living under. It is because we understand the complexity of the cell. And then we go, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to solve now that problem too. And now that problem. I mean, you, you look at just, just DNA, DNA being, being the, the informational code. But now we're learning it's not just the DNA. There's levels of system information beyond that. I mean, up until 10 years ago, I mean, there was people called this 95% of the DNA was, was uh, junk DNA. But now we know it's not junk, it's intergenic DNA. And when they say we are 98.5% the same as a chimpanzee, that's correct. When you look for the major coding part of the DNA, you know, you have a model that works, you use it, you duplicate it over and over again. And that's why, a, you know, a, a tiny little car is going to have the, the many of the same types of structures that you're going to find in a Ferrari. I mean, because they work. But then you look at the what was previously called junk DNA, which is now called intergenic DNA, and Project ENCODE, which was to decipher what's going on in this, this intergenic DNA. And now we're finding thousands upon thousands of, of uh, uh, regulatory pieces of information that are going and this is where there are major differences between us and the chimpanzee there's all this regulation going on and so so all of a sudden i have to deal with so much more so we can tell in science that we're not we're getting further away from the target so this is how i know but as a scientist i could never say we will never know and because how could i know that that would be a total guess, like I'm criticizing other people about their total guesses concerning origin of life. So I would never, ever say that. All I'm saying is that we're nowhere close. I have no idea where humankind is going to be in 500 or 1,000 years on their understanding of science. If you had asked a man in the year 1600, 
will we ever have space travel and land on the moon and be able to bring people back? They'd be like, I mean, we'll never fly. We, people just can't fly. There, there had never been flight. How could they answer a question and say, we will never get to the moon and back. They, they don't have a context to answer that. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't have a context to answer, to say we will never be able to do it. I can just speak for today and in the near future. By the near future, I'm telling you 50 years out. We're not going to solve this problem in the next 50 years because we are so far from it and the target is, is just streaming away from us. But I could never say. So that's why when, when many people have accused me of God of the gap, I've gone back to videos like this and I've said, when did I say it could never be solved? When did I say? I've always said the opposite. I've said, I presume one day we will solve it. But that doesn't negate God. Just because we now understand the structure of DNA, because prior to the 1950s, we didn't know why, you know, when two parents are tall, their kid is tall. I mean, it just happened to be, but we didn't know why. But now we know why, because that prescription is written into the DNA that then encodes through RNA into the enzymes that build us. So there was the code for it. So now that we understand DNA, it doesn't lessen God in my eyes. It makes him all the more magnanimous, like, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you did it. So this is so so to understand, to be able to project this is how life formed, I'd be like, Oh, so that's what you meant when you said, you know, you, you, you took Adam and, and you, you, you took this clay of the ground and you made him. That was the, 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 uh, um, the allegorical behind, the, 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 that's the allegorical behind what you did. And, and so that, that's, that's all I can do. So, so, yeah, so that's my position. Yeah, and, and for me, the, as far as the God of the Gap, the, the, well, you positioned it quite, quite well. Um, I was, remember I was doing a talk on science and faith. Wes, well, a friend of mine was, and I was just joining him for Q&A um, years ago at a university. And one of the guys, one of the students got up at the back and said, you know, my problem is here is that faith is believing things without evidence. And science is all about coming to beliefs because of evidence. And so faith, by definition, is therefore a science stopper. And so anything you believe is because of gaps in our science. But the more we learn, the less we need to have faith. We had this conversation back and forth. And um, I mentioned Proverbs 22, Proverbs 25, verses 2 and 3, where mm -hmm. God conceals things so we can discover them. And the history of science, uh, and, science and my colleague had done this too the history of scientists who believed and didn't compartmentalize their faith and their scientific endeavor. Um, but one of the things that, um, it, it, that I pointed out to him, I'd love to get your reaction on this in terms of just understanding of how we look at these things in terms of God of the gaps is um, it would be a full God of the gaps argument if we said, you can't explain it and anything you can't explain, I shove God into the gap and that... Uh, is adequate and I can move on from there. And I said, um, one of the things that's interesting to me is that that's not how Christians, who, especially Christians who are scientists, actually think, is that one of the ways we look at things is that we make our observations based on the data. And the data as we have it today is that whenever you see intelligibility, you see an intelligence behind it. Whenever you see pattern and information, and I don't mean just random information like uh, uh, Schachter information and these kind of, Shannon. I mean, like real information, functional, you know, sequent, uh, uh, the kind of information that has a, um, a function to it and specified complexity. You always see a mind behind it. And so right now, um, you are completely rational to believe that um, because there is not only no way that we know of, we're not even close to knowing about how life formed. And the science seems to suggest, you know, quote, uh, one of the quotes that, uh, from Stephen Meyer's quote from a chat he had with you was, the chemistry acting on its own wants to move away from a life-friendly direction. Um, given all of that, you're perfectly rational to surmise or to lead to the conclusion that there has to be an intelligence behind this, or it's very highly likely there's an intelligence behind it. Um, so what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I want to give, uh, I'll answer that, in, in, and then I, I think Derek had, had a question, so I want to sure. take his question. So 
um, this this whole thing of of an intelligence behind this. It certainly seems like there's an intelligence behind this because of the complexity that's there, because of the code. So even even uh, uh, Lee Cronin, who's an origin of life researcher and one with whom I've clashed many times. But I, by the way, I consider Lee a friend and, and I can consider uh, Steve Benner a friend. And so I can have clashes with people and still walk away and consider them a friend. And after mm-hmm. my little debate with uh, 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 Lee Cronin at Harvard. I mean, the cameras were off, but I right away shook his hand and thanked him for coming and, and uh, uh, no problem with, with that. And so, so um, uh, it certainly appears that there, there's, there's an intelligence behind this because even, even uh, uh, Lee will say there was a code that came from outside the cell outside the genome, there had to have been some code. And that's what you're seeing. There had to have been some code of intelligibility here. So it certainly looks like that. Now, I can't say that for sure. Maybe there's something we'll learn that in, in the future. But what I can say, you look at it today, it certainly looks as if there's a code. Now, yeah. if, I, if I come from my Christian perspective, it, this is clear. I mean, God made the heavens and the earth in six days. He created it. And uh, uh, so, so God did this, and he came up with one advance, and there was this progression of the things he did over these six days. And, and whether you want to take a day as a, as a 24-hour day, or which is hard to do in an expanding universe because the days change in, in the number of hours, depending on where you are in the expansion of the universe, or whether you want to take it as, as long epochs of time. That is beside the point of what I'm trying to say. It is right. clear that God has created this from the Bible, but as a scientist, I can't go that far to say that because I just don't have a scientific uh, 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 measurement to say that. But yeah, it certainly appears as if there's there's uh, 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 a real intelligence behind this. Uh, I don't know. Did I answer your, 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 no, you did. your question? I, that's exactly what okay. I was asking about is that you can take science so far and then it takes just the ability to say, okay, based on how I understand the data, we te- we whenever we see intelligibility, we see an intelligence behind it. it. The science suggests that life is intelligible and has a plan to it, and therefore it's not a leap of faith, as it were, into common parlance to say, therefore it looks like at the time, based on all we know right now, there's an intelligence behind this. Could that be changed by the, by the science? Maybe. But right now, yes. based on all we know, we're not making an argument based on what we don't know. We're making an argument based on what we do know. And, and the terminology uh, um, that even biologists and chemists are now using is they'll say, they'll speak of design. They'll say this, this, this design, and they'll, they'll u- even use those terms. Mm. And what Lee Cronin is now using a lot, it has a causal history. Uh, they, they don't want to use the term intelligent design, and I don't, I don't use that term either. Mm-hmm. But he says it has a causal history. Mm-hmm. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. Have a causal history. We're, we're parsing words now, but they, they don't want to say the word. Yeah. And so they, they come up with a different terminology, but it's yeah. the same thing. It has a causal history. That thing has, has, has uh, been caused to be there. It has a causal history. So, yeah. so they, they, they are beset with this. Because that is so much the appearance. Derek, you had a question. Well, actually, um, I, I just had a comment, but that, that causal history part is helpful there, too, because there is this... Uh, Christians have may have the tendency to get afraid. And when you hear uh, this, you almost imbue what the, what the accusation is in the God of the gaps into that when you hear, oh, no, if something is explained later, that's another place where you don't need God. But even what you just said there is like, but there's still this causal history. And it's this tendency to, th- a very human tendency to think once I understand something, now I'm the master of it. We don't need God. It's a very Garden of Eden, knowledge of good and evil. Now we're the sort of masters of ethics. We don't need God to tell us right and wrong, um, that that sort of uh, model. But it's interesting because we don't actually, that's not what our belief is in 
anyway, our belief is in Jesus. And I've never gotten up in church and said, you know, I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in the gaps of my un scientific understanding. And, and so that's never been our, our faith, but we do fall into that. We almost um, are even defeated when we say there is still a, a gap. So I just, I thought that was just a very helpful way of saying, hey, it may be solved one day. I hope it is solved one day. That would be great. That will do nothing to challenge my faith. How, how could it? It was just, yeah, that was fascinating. Right. And, 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 and when we study science, this is exactly what happens. I mean, I am just blown away all the time with God's creative power. I mean, it's just, just amazing. I mean, life, to think of, of, of something living, it's very hard as a chemist to see how that could come together. Mm. You go outside, you flip over a rock, and it's just teeming with life under there. And, and you put it under a microscope, and there's a gazillion times more life that you see. And it's just all this life that's ubiquitous on this planet. And you go to any other planet, there's no life. You, what you should expect, based on the chemistry, is you should expect exactly what you find on other planets. Barrenness. No life, no record of life, nothing. Nothing related to life. That's what you would expect. And that there's life teeming here so th this is amazing and you and i just praise god for it w when i learn about we, we, we are modifying bacteria we, we'll let bacteria just go through several generations generation after generation of modifications to see if we can now kill them with our antibiotics in my own lab this is what we do and you see how clever these bacteria are to stay alive i mean there's one bacterium that, that somehow had a genetic defect that allowed it to survive and so now it starts sharing its dna with all the other bacteria so now all of a sudden you got a whole population of bacteria that that don't don't succumb to this this uh this antibiotic and and it 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 didn't have to share its its DNA by having offspring. It, it, it just, just, the little tubules go out and it starts injecting parts of its DNA into into other bacteria, and all of a sudden you have this population. And then they double their population every twenty minutes. Every twenty minutes they double the population. These bacteria are amazing, <laughs> and and uh, these don't have a brain. They're just single cell organisms. And you look at this, you say, uh, the, these things were designed to be insidious toward humans. These things were, were, were uh, they really cause us trouble. And then they get, they get into a, 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 a biofilm. And in that biofilm, they're protected from, from lots of drugs coming in. And then in there, they just start exchanging DNA. Uh, it, it's amazing. It's just utterly amazing what life can do, and it gives you all the more appreciation for it. So I think, you know, when you're a scientist, you end up loving God all the more because there's all this stuff that you see, that, that the poor man on the street, the woman on the street, they don't know this. They don't know what I know, and, and uh, they, they, they have no appreciation for it. It's like, it's like uh, I'm colorblind, and I am. I am colorblind. And so there's, there's so many things that people appreciate in paintings that I can't appreciate because they see it's so much more than what I can see. And, and I feel like that's what it is with science. There's so much more that I can appreciate in God's creation because I see all these other things, but there's many things I don't know. And you would think, okay, well, Jim Tour figured this all out. I have more questions than anybody else. I do. I mean, and you throw the whole quantum mechanics into this thing, and, you know, electron is not here, and it's not here. It's in both places at the same time. Now, it may be more here than here, but it's in both places. And this is what you're taught when you learn quantum mechanics, and it actually happens to be the case. And, and, uh, uh, and so... In many ways, when you think that, that, that God is omnipresent, okay, well, electrons are omnipresent too. I mean, so it's not that far of a leap to understand this. And, and now we're building quantum computers based upon this. That, that, and, and we're building computing systems based on this. And, and uh, I still have lots of questions about it, but this is real stuff. You can do computing based on these wild ideas. Hmm. And, and uh, uh, so there's so much we absolutely do not understand. And that's why I love science, because you're like, wow, this is amazing. And, and I had no idea. And God just, just has this. So that's, yeah. that's how I, I love the Lord. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and and I love science. Boy, Derek, I gotta, we gotta close on that. There's no way I, I, I'm gonna, maybe I'll say 30 seconds of something uh, in response to that. That was just too good to like, uh, so I have to, this is the format of the show, Jim, I have to say something. Yeah. Um, but I'd rather just, um, we're, that's gonna be a clip somewhere. We're gonna have to do that. Uh, thank you so much for um, your time. Uh, Jim, uh, Dr. Tour, you've been so helpful in so many ways in this, this brief time. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, uh, we got to have you back on. I'd love to do that again um, if you're so amenable to doing so. Um, and could I just say one thing before please. you close? If any of your listeners do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you contact me, write to tour at drjamestour.org. Or you can just Google Jim Tour, Jim T O U R, and and an email will pop up. And and uh, if you just write to me and tell me that you don't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, then give me the chance to speak with you. I'll set up a time. We'll set up a time. I'll meet with you for one hour, and uh, uh, you will come out of that time believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And mm-hmm. we'll, we'll do it virtually. We'll set it up by Zoom, and it'll be done. I don't care what time time zone you're in, we'll figure out a time to meet and, and probably do it within the week that you contact me. We'll make it happen. Wow. Well, there you have it, friends. Don't tell us, don't, don't ever say we don't give you something. Dr. James Tour just gave you that. And, uh, that's terrific. Uh, take it up on the opportunity. You will be, um, benefited in ways you won't, uh, yet anticipate. Um, and believing in that resurrection is not just an intellectual affair. Uh, my closing argument would be this to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, you can take um, an understanding of how science actually works and see the beauty that is around us through this method that allows us, that is, I believe, a God-given gift to not only our rational minds, but the method and the intelligibility of the universe to see something so amazing that's around us that it inspires someone with such passion. And you saw the passion crescendo during the course of our episode together. I, I hope you can notice the pattern as Dr. Tour started and Dr. Tour ended is that um, the pa- that not only did the science increase the, the level to which the excitement built, but also where it pointed was um, uh, part of that, that growing crescendo. Uh, an expert uh, in, in his field can see the beauty in um, uh, the creation around him because he's taken his time to look through these things uh, and see these things. So I do recommend going to his website, uh, to his uh, YouTube page, um, uh, James Tour. Just look him up on YouTube and you'll get a a bunch of great information there and some good videos that will help to help you out. Um, one of the last things I'll say about this is this, and, and, and Dr. Tour uh, explained it far better than I could. Um, oftentimes when we make assumptions about the universe, about the way the world is, and one of those assumptions is, is that it's here by accident. There's no prevision in mind. There's no design in any of this. We make that assumption, and sometimes that itself can be the science stopper. When you look at the ENCODE project and you look at the way in which uh, the so-called junk DNA was assumed as to be just a vestige of uh, a blind, um, random evolutionary process that had no prevision in mind whatsoever of the design of the animals that were being created from it, you'd expect to see a bunch of junk, so-called junk DNA. And that was an assumption. But along come some people who say, let's challenge the assumption. Let's challenge that assumption. And we find that the the so-called junk DNA isn't so junky after all. It regulates so much. It seems to me, just seems to me, that had we made an assumption earlier that maybe this isn't a matter of randomness, maybe there is something behind this. We don't have to agree that there's an intelligence behind it, but let's think maybe there is one. Maybe we would have got there faster. Maybe it wouldn't have taken this long to challenge the assumption of junk DNA. It's just but one example of some things. So if there's one thing, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that I hope you get, Uh, And there's many things you'll get out of this conversation. What I hope you get is this, is that the more you study science and the more answers you get through this marvel and this gift we have called science, the more questions you'll have. And the good news is the questions drive us to find answers because it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but he gives us the glory of humanity to seek it out. I hope you do that, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Go to Dr. Tour's uh, YouTube page, and you'll be um, uh, all the more blessed for having done so. And take him up on his offer. An expert witness just told you he'll spend some time with you to show you the physical resurrection of Jesus. Take him up on his offer, and you'll, you'll be all the better for it. That's 
on behalf of Derek Caldwell, my colleague, uh, and uh, Zach Falzon, who has produced this, uh, helped us produce this show. Uh, I'm Abdu Murray for Embrace the Truth. And um, for now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Dr. Tour. The Defense Rest. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button, and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, it's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work, and if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you. Thank you.